Hi, I'm Holly, and with my sister Heather, you're listening to Haunted Family Podcast, a weekly podcast about the paranormal, unsolved mysteries, and even some true crime. And even. So, um, today is the one year anniversary of the beginning of our East Coast tour of Trollet, Trollet, Pilot Truck Stops, (laughs) and whatever Trollet is. Yes, well, okay. And by one year anniversary, we mean the one year anniversary of us recording this, not like whenever right. you're listening yes. to it. And I am so mad like, at myself about this trip. I mean, like, yes, we did great things. We went to Salem, which is awesome. And I would pack up and move to Salem, like, right now. The Literally the nicest people I've ever encountered in my life live in Salem, Massachusetts. Um... But, I mean, this is a true crime episode, and, you know, you would think that we are being listened to by true crime fans. Guys, we were in Baltimore, and I did not go to Lincoln Park. I did not drive the Jay and Adnan route. I actually completely and totally forgot about the whole Heyman Lee case because I was so focused on Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of, you know, her defense. We really hadn't planned on Baltimore. But when we got close, we were like, hey, let's go see Edgar Allan Poe's grave. And then we got so excited about all that. I mean, I've seen his grave a few times before, but... We, yeah, we got so caught up in visiting the Edgar Allan Poe sites that we completely forgot about other famous things that's happened. Yeah, I, in I was Baltimore. so mad at myself. And then I didn't even realize it until we got halfway to New York. And I was like, oh my God. But then, you know, we got to New York and, you know, a guy peed on our car, which was kind of cool. Uh, I think New Jersey cost us $200 yeah, actually, in tolls. At least 150. At this point, at this point in time, Holly, we were still stuck in New Jersey. Yes. I mean, one, you guys, I feel so sorry for you if you live in New Jersey because the turnpike sucks ass. And it, it literally cost us $150, possibly 200 But I know that that last little thing to get us out was like 50 It's actually very funny. I had to run into our sheriff's office the other day. Um, to pick up an accident report, and while there, we was talking. I was talking to a friend of mine about something, and another friend of ours has just moved back to upstate New York. And I was like, "Yeah, you know, if um, we ever make another trip up to that area, I might swing up to Buffalo and visit him." And then I was like, "But I promise you, I will never go through the state of New Jersey again." And the sheriff was like, "Oh, really? Why?" So then I had to tell the whole sheriff's office about our ordeal in New Jersey. And I was like, and then you hit the bridge going into New York City. And it's like they literally pull out a gun and hold it to your head and rob you one last time as you're going across the bridge. You know, and one of my closest friends moved here from New Jersey. And she swears that we literally saw the worst. She says that actually New Jersey is a wonderful state and she loves it and that, you know, she has great memories of her childhood and and teen years, but... Then why did she move to Kentucky? Because her parents moved. Oh. But still. Parents probably knew what was up. (laughs) They were like, uh, the toll booth will um, rob us and we will not be able to afford to go anywhere. But yeah, and you know what? I'm sure there are absolutely beautiful spots in New Jersey. Right. But although when we went, y'all's state was like closed, so we couldn't have even gone to a beach or a park or anything. It was yeah. sad, sad times. But those damn toll booths were stir, stir, stir. I cannot talk tonight. Was sure working. <laughs> yes. The T in turnpike means toll booth. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> Um, but honestly, wonderful trip, and 
we totally plan on visiting New England again. And the next time we are on our way to Massachusetts, we will definitely stop in Baltimore and visit some true crime spots. Yeah, I was so I was so mad at myself. And I've kicked myself for an entire year about that. Well, you know, we're only a few hours away. I know. We're going to have to go. I mean, we're what, like eight hours from Baltimore, I think? Mm, I don't know. So this episode... Oh, I'm sorry. Do you have any other updates or anything? Um... Oh, actually, kind of. Um, we have started adding true paranormal stories to our YouTube channel. Yes, we well, have. I say we. we it's, it's me. Yeah, I have not. I do no, not do uh, the me. whole. I don't do. I don't do YouTube. No, the YouTube channel is all my baby. Um, shooting the ain't. I'm aiming to add at least one video of true paranormal stories a week. Last week I actually added two videos, and I have um, interviews set up in the next coming weeks with um, local people who have a very interesting paranormal story to tell, and that will be going up on our YouTube channel. So if you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, you probably should, because it's going to get interesting. Cool. Um, no yes, another update. Um, if you follow us on you follow us on our Instagram. Then you probably saw a post I made the other day about a friend of mine whose daughter is missing in um, the Iowa area. She is actually missing in the Davenport Quad City area. She is still missing. So if you live in that area of the country, visit our Instagram page, take a look at her picture, and if you spot her, call 911. Okay, let's get on with the show. Okay, so this actually happened when I was in high school. And it was, this is probably the first... You're around the same age as the, these girls. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm like right, I'm the same age as one of them, but I'm right in the middle of like all of them because their age is kind of very. Um, it was the very first true crime book I ever read. My, yeah, I think it was my very first true crime book also. And I probably was way too young to actually read this book when I read it. Oh, yeah. Well, my I remember it because my aunt gave me the book to read because the girls are about my age. But because we had a, we had a, a murder that happened in our family. And we've talked about it uh, um, before. And... Um, it was kind of a, not really the same situation, but in a way, yes. You know, a group of kids, all the same age. You know, there had been warning signs before. And then, um, so the, the mother of our cousin gave me this book to read um, because I had a um, encounter with the person we think is the killer shortly after it happened and I, yeah it was a whole thing I was interviewed by the FBI and everything I didn't know you were interviewed by the FBI yeah yeah they interviewed me because of that because I had I had talked to her I, and I don't even remember who the see. agent's name was but he had one blue eye and one brown eye and it was very freaky neat yeah um anyway so because of that this is the first book i read it is also the first true crime book that hank ever ate um interesting hank being, i know yeah hank being my french bulldog he did not um he did not enjoy it or maybe he really enjoyed it i don't know but anyway he literally ate the book so there's that so, anyway. Oh, this is sad. What? 
the Mothman Museum just announced on their Facebook page that apparently the Point Pleasant River Museum was damaged by fire today. Oh, that is sad. So you want to jump right in? Okay. I will say that when Abby... I will say that when Abby came out as lesbian, this whole story was one of the first things that came to my mind. Really? It wasn't my, It wasn't for me. Yeah, it was for me. Because teenage girls are... Can we say this? Teenage girls are crazy. Mean. What? They're just mean. They are. And they're hormonal, and they're crazy, and they're vindictive, and yeah... So, yeah, this, this this case was one of the first things that came to my mind. We are talking about the Shanda Share case today. And I am so, like, all over the place about this. So, I hope that I can keep my train of thought going in a way that you guys can uh, follow well, my notes are all over the place, so. Okay, so, I, I was going to start with the childhood of the criminals, but I think I'm going to save that for the sentencing part. Shanda was actually, all of this happened within like three hour drive for me. So, Shanda was 12 years old. She was born June 6, 1979. So, she was three years younger than me when all this happened. And so, she was born in Pineville, Kentucky, which we have so many connections to Pineville, it's, it's not even funny. And it's a super, super small town. Um, her parents were Stephen Shayer and Jacqueline Shayer. And people call her Jackie. So they got divorced. Yeah. Uh, Jacqueline and Stephen got divorced. And Jackie moved to Louisville. Which is, I mean, if you know anything about geography, Louisville is right on the river, and then, like, you can see Indiana. And then she got remarried and then got divorced again. And when they got divorced again, they moved literally right across the bridge to Indiana in New Albany. And she enrolled her in Hazelwood Middle School. Now, she stayed there for a while until she started uh, a relationship with a girl named Amanda Heverin. And then the mom pulled her out of that school and put her in a Catholic school, Our Lady of Perpetual Help. And if you watch any, um, doc any um, interviews with her mom, her mom is really in denial that her daughter was lesbian. I'm like, listen, when I watched that interview, uh, where the Dr. Phil interview, where Amanda was saying that the mom has made her life miserable, and the mom said, no, I've not done anything to you, and you're guilty, you're just as guilty as the murderers, I, I wanted to puke. And she kept calling her a child molester. Listen. Honestly. You cannot be a child molester. Amanda is. If you were also a child. It is not like Amanda, Amanda was 18 and no. Shanda was 12. So, I feel that Amanda is a victim in this also. Absolutely. Which, I mean, we'll get to we'll get to the whole Amanda thing. I'm sorry to jump that but, in. But, I, but it just... Ugh. And Dr. Phil did not make... I... I did not like the Dr. Philly interview because I think he was making excuses and justifications for the mom's behavior. I'm sorry, just because she lost her daughter does not mean that she can be a horrible human being to Amanda. Right. I think and that so, her mom really needed to confront the hard issue of the fact that her daughter is a les was a lesbian. Right, and for her mom to say, well, she was 12 years old, she didn't know... 
Listen, I knew that my daughter was gay when she was probably eight years old. She didn't even know she was gay yet. And she had many boyfriends before she finally came out. And she was... Was she 12? She was about 12 or 13 when she came out. And she had had a boyfriend, a steady boyfriend for a couple of years. So it was just one of those things. When she, she sent me a text and she said, Mom, I have something important to tell you. I'm gay and I like Hannah. And I said, okay, what's the something really important? No, she, I'm sorry. It wasn't important. She said, I've got something really serious to tell you. And I said, okay, well, what's the something really serious? Because that's not serious. Like, you wouldn't make a big deal to tell me that you like a different boy. So don't make it a big deal that you like a girl. And you know what? She yeah. and Hannah have been together ever since. And they are super adorable together. And I would literally go to prison if somebody tried to hurt them I would I would take you down I think I think I think the mother in this case will grieve would grieve a lot better if she was honest with herself with who her daughter was right it's not the end of the world if your child likes a girl if they're a girl and it's not the end of the world if your boy likes a boy I mean, Ernie and I joke that both of our children, both of our firstborns, are gay. And you know what? It's fine. Do we make a big deal of it? No. It's just what it is. I was like, it just means that I'm going to have an extra daughter and, and we're going to have an extra son, but not in the order that you would think that we would. It's fine. Well. The, actually, the only, only difference is when Abby and Hannah have kids, they're either going to have to adopt or they're going to have to do some hardcore fertility. Okay. I had to take fertility to have her. It's fine. Well, honestly, Chandra's mom, in this case, I don't think is a very good person to begin with. I think she created a very turbulent home for her I child. think all of these parents did. They did. Every last one of these children that was involved in this came from a very messed up home life. They did not have parents that was creating structure and boundaries and good safe supportive environments and that cre that created a firestorm when you mixed with emotional teenage girl stuff i don't have an age for amanda was she also 14 amanda was 15 okay so you've got a girl that's three years older than your daughter and you're seriously going to say that they molested your child now, okay, I know that you can you can have rape and all that at twelve and fifteen, and that's n I'm not saying that I'm not discounting that, but by all accounts, Shanda was saying that they were a couple, so she didn't molest your daughter. If you're listening to this, they were in a relationship, and you can't handle that. So anyway, enough of that. Melinda Loveless was 14. And in 1990, she started dating Amanda Heffern, who we have been talking about. And um, Melinda had a very rough childhood, which we'll get to when we start talking about the reasoning that the girl said that they did this. So, she had a rough life, and kind of Amanda was her anchor, but when her dad left, she started, she just, like, completely lost it, 
and she would get in fights and she was depressed and um, she went into counseling at, at this time she came out to her mom uh, but her mom was okay with it and then all of that just got too much for Amanda and she left well Amanda and Shanda met at Hazelwood Junior High and they got into a fight with each other and then they became friends when they were in detention they started writing each other love letters and they would talk to each other and they would hang out with each other and Melinda got crazy jealous and in 91, October of 91, uh, Amanda and Shanda went to a dance together, and Melinda found out and confronted them. And that's very forward for the early 90s. Oh, yeah. I mean, I remember, I mean, I went to high school at this time. This, you know, all of these girls are my age. And we had no, we had no girls that were out. At, at my high school. We had probably three that everybody suspected, but they were not out. We had no one out in my high school, and I'm six years younger than you. Although, there was a few people that we knew were gay. Right, and then a few years later, our cousin came out, and, I mean, and that was in 2000s, and that was a big deal. Like, that she was out in high school and, you know, holding hands with her girlfriend. and But now, I mean, it's, I mean, it's nothing. You know, Abby and Hannah have been out since, well, Hannah came out just a couple of years ago. But Abby's been out since, you know, middle school. And I'm glad. I'm glad that it's much more accepting. Except, accepted. I can't talk tonight. So, anyway, the uh, the tension just kept, you know, Melinda did not want to let Amanda go. Amanda wanted to be in a relationship with Shanda. It was just a really messy love triangle. Uh, Melinda would write letters to Amanda telling her that she was going to kill Shanda. And Amanda did what she would, should have done. She gave the letters to a youth prosecutor and told her dad. Youth prosecutor did nothing. I think that the adults in their lives thought that this was just typical teenage girl overreactions. Mm -hmm. And then nothing was going to come from it. Right. So, But sometimes when a teenage girl tells you they're going to kill you, they mean it. Yeah, and they kill you. And that's what happened in this situation. So, Melinda gathered up some of her friends. Tony Lawrence, who was 15. Hope Rippey, who was 15. Laurie Tackett, who was 17. And then, of course, Melinda, who was 16. And they got in Tackett's car. And they drove to Melinda's house. And they kind of, like, they pre-gamed. Like, it was a, they were going to a party or something. They tried on clothes and they put their makeup on and they fixed their hair and I mean they they got ready for this you know they talked about it they laughed about it and in a in another interview Laurie was saying that she didn't know going into it that this was going to happen yes you did you spent all day laughing and joking and planning it you can't say that oh, I didn't know it was going to happen yes you did yeah, because, I mean, that was literally what you all had plotted all day. They go to, like, a skate park or something. They go to some kind of thing. I'm sorry, I cannot remember for the life of me what that was called. But they didn't stay long. Like, two of them got bored and went out and, and started making out with guys in the parking lot where they said, hey, we're going to kill a girl tonight. The guys didn't believe it. Which they should have, I guess. All the girls get back in the car. Um, go to Shanda's house. And they knock on the door. And her dad answers. And they stumble. Oh, Holly. Yes. It was 
Audubon Skate Park in Louisville that they went to to see a um, punk rock band. That's it. So then they go to Shanda's hat to her dad's house and knock on the door. Well, not all of them. Two of them go. And um, the the dad said that he that it it, it seemed weird because they it almost seemed like they didn't know who they were asking for or anything. Like it was a very awkward thing. So he said no, that she couldn't go. But this is where parents of teenagers should know. I know, because I was a teenager. I remember. If they ask you if they can do something and you say no, you have to watch them like a hawk because they will try to find a way to go. This is usually the point, and we saw this with the Brittany Drexel case, where, okay, fine, I'm not going to go to Myrtle Beach. Can I just go spend the night with my friend? And then what she do? She hightailed it to Myrtle Beach. Like, And then she got abducted and killed. Right. Teenagers, they just don't know. They don't think their brain does Their brain is not developed enough to make good, solid, logically thought out decisions yet. Right. And so it is us as parents to know that they're going to try to do something stupid if we say no. My kids know I have this rule. If they ask me if they could do something more than twice, like if I say no, and then they ask me again, they automatically can't go anywhere. So there's no point in it even asking. And I have my house set up so that nobody can sneak out. So it really sucks, you know, for somebody trying to sneak out and do something that they can't do. But your children are so clumsy that if they try to sneak out a window... One of them would fall and break something. Yeah, probably. And so, then make a trip across the highway to the hospital. So Shanda arranged for them to come back at 1230 when her dad and stepmom is asleep. And they do. So at this time, Melinda is hiding in the back underneath a blanket with a knife uh, and they they tell Shanda that they're going to take her to the witch's castle because that's where Amanda is and she didn't really want to go but she decided to go ahead and go so they get her in the car I mean and this is such typical mean girl behavior which mean is actually the title of the SVU episode on this and every time I watch it, I'm just so, I'm just so horrified at how people are. But anyway, so they're asking her, you know, about her relationship with Amanda and how things are going. And uh, Melinda jumps out of the back seat and puts the knife to Shanda's throat. They drive to... Um, I'm probably pronouncing this wrong, but Utica, Indiana, which is all, it's all right there, to this place called the Witch's Castle. And it's really just an old stone building that's partially burnt down. But they don't make it there. They just start going in that direction. Shanda is crying and freaking out. Well, they pull over on the, on the side of the road. Kind of a, an old logging road, which is, you know, pretty much abandoned. And they tie her up. And then they're taunting her and, you know, just being assholes. And uh, they, you know, joke about cutting off her hair. And, you know, I mean, she's freaking out. She's 12 years old and she's terrified. So they take off her clothes. Melinda takes her rings and each girl gets one. Um, Hope takes her Mickey Mouse watch and then they um, just start beating her. You know what I mean? Like yeah. with their hands and. They actually tried to cut her throat, but the knife they brought was 
too dull. Yeah, if you could imagine that. And then they take that knife and they stab her in the chest repeatedly. Um, but she doesn't die yet. No, she does not die. For seven hours. Seven hours. So, basically, an entire time that you're at work, they're torturing her. Yeah. Um, at one point, they decide to shove her back in the trunk, and they start driving around. Mm-hmm. And every time they hear her making noise in the trunk, they pull over and beat her with a tire iron. Right. She's bloody and gurgling, and this baby hangs on. She's still alive. I mean, she is alive. I, I could not even imagine going through what she's going through. I cannot. They go back to Laurie's house. And they're eating breakfast and getting cleaned up. And uh, they hear her screaming in the trunk. And they beat her some more. So then they decided to leave. And they... Go get gas. They actually they get a uh, bottle of Pepsi, dump it out, and fill it up with gas. And then they take her just right off the side of the road um, and pour gasoline on her and set her on fire. And um, she is still, she's, she's still alive at she's, this point in time. Yeah. But right up until they set her on fire, she's begging them to take her home. I mean, so they set, they not only beat her and stab her, but then they set her on fire. Um. And then they go to the mall. Yeah. Um, I will say that during the the torture and whatever that uh, Hope and Tony do stay in the car. They're scared. Um, but I don't care. Oh, the fact I that don't they either. Did not try to stop it because they didn't try to stop them it. Just as guilty. But that's why she ended up, that's why those two ended up getting less time. So, the very next day, uh, her body is found. Um, they, uh, they haven't been arrested or anything yet. They go to Amanda's house. Where they show her the bloody trunk of the car with Shanda's bloody handprints and her socks, and she freaks out. Tony and Hope actually, as soon as they get home, they tell their parents everything. But Steve actually reported uh, Shanda missing, I'm not for sure what time, it just says early January 11th. He calls neighbors and friends, uh, calls his ex-wife, and at 1.45 p.m. they filed the missing person. She was still alive at 1.45. Yeah. At 8.20 p.m., Tony and Hope go to the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office with their parents. They tell everything. They, you know, say the victim's name. Every, they describe everything that was in that was done to her and everything that was involved and Melinda and Laurie were arrested on January the 12th Hope and Laurie had history of self-harming Laurie had been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and Melinda had a horrific childhood i mean her i don't even know where to start with this i mean like anything that you could possibly think of happened so 
Okay. Uh, There's one thing that I found that was interesting in this. Okay. Did you read th that um, Hope Ruby's house was had an exorcism performed on it, and apparently Melinda had a exorcism performed on her? No. Well, I knew that Melinda had. In at, while they were children. Yeah. Okay. So Melinda was born in 75, October of 75. She was the youngest of three girls to Marjorie and Larry Loveless. Larry was a Vietnam vet. And when he came back, you know, everybody, you know, was just hailing him ha as a hero. Uh, his wife, though, said that he was a pervert and that he would wear her makeup uh, and her and her daughter's underwear. He was constantly unfaithful, and but that's nothing. Apparently, they had a um, swinger relationship, not of her choosing. No, he basically uh, prostituted her out, and when she wouldn't do it willingly, he would rape her, and he didn't care if it was within earshot of the kids or not. She tried to commit suicide a number of times right. because of his treatment of her. It is not confirmed that he molested the children also. Right. A cousin but, of theirs um, said that he had raped all of his girls and her. On numerous occasions. On numerous occasions. Right. Um, so this he, might be one of those cases where um, Melinda and her sisters have blocked out childhood trauma right the uh her dad had issues keeping a job he uh worked for southern railroad for a while um he worked for the police department but was let go after eight months because he assaulted a african-american man with his partner um he worked for the post office and it says was quit he quit after three months but I know that your probationary period ends after 90 days and so they give you an option if they know that they're already going to fire you they give you the option to quit so that you could be rehired at maybe another post office like if it doesn't work out for whatever considering reason he was burning mail i don't think they was going to rehire him. oh no that is that's that's a that's a big bag thing you don't want to do that um so, I'm sure that they knew they were not going to hire him, but I'm sure that they also fired him because that's bad. Um, yeah, he, he would bring his mail home and then burn it or shred it or something so that he didn't have to deliver it. Um, the uh, neighbors and family would say that the girls were always hungry and whenever they would come to their house, they would just be starving. So, they've witnessed their mother's rape. They probably were raped themselves. And they were always hungry. And they've witnessed their mother trying to commit suicide on multiple occasions. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. N not only did Larry rape his wife, but at one time he had her gang raped, too. I mean, I just cannot even wrap my brain around this so i mean on one hand melinda loveless is a murderer but on the other hand i just want to hug her and be like you poor child i know i mean i i normally have absolutely no empathy towards murderers but melinda's life was so traumatic and nobody got her help i mean she herself was still a kid and nobody nobody got her help her parents were uh, pretty her dad was so caught up in his own needs and wants no one really cared about her right and so at one time uh 
the family decided, I mean, I'm sure by the family that meant Larry decided that they were going to get involved in Graceland Baptist Church. And they gave up all of their swinging and became super active in the church. And uh, Larry became a lay preacher, a marriage counselor, which made me laugh. Yeah, I mean, I know I would totally trust him to be my marriage counselor uh, if I was married. Yeah, well, listen, I have gone to marriage counseling and uh, I would not go to him. Holly so, told her marriage counselor once that she was going to shoot her ex, her now ex-husband. I didn't actually say well, it that I'm sorry. Way. She didn't say that she was going to shoot him. She said that his second ex-wife's mistake was not pulling the trigger when she pulled the gun on him. Yeah, so my ex-husband... Um, and I, yeah, so my ex-husband was married before me. A couple times. And a couple times before me, yeah. And so his, one of his ex-wives pulled a gun on him. And, and this, this story is per him. He told me this. She pulled a gun on him, his gun actually. And then, um, after a few minutes, put it away and said, you're not worth the bullet. I told the marriage counselor that her biggest mistake was not pulling that trigger when she had the gun out. Apparently, he was being very mean to her children. Yeah. So, I but am a mama me bear. And Holly, me and Holly always grew up in a household where you don't pull a gun on somebody you don't plan on killing. That's true. If you pull a gun, you better be ready to pull the trigger. That's Otherwise, we'll take the gun from you and then, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's just... Dad taught us how to shoot when we were little, and that was just rule number one of of owning a gun. You don't pull it unless you're ready to use it. Um, but anyway, so Larry and the church uh, decided that Melinda needed to be exercised. So she was in a hotel room for five hours with a 50-year-old man for her exorcism and I know that you cannot see me but I just air quoted that because I really have a hard time believing that for one that thing, was a five hour exorcism well I mean for one thing um, exorcisms rarely involve just one person performing the exorcism yeah and I didn't really think yeah. that that was a Baptist thing but well I mean I know I'm sure Baptists can perform exorcisms None of the Baptists that I know are Believe qualified that. to perform exorcisms. Right. But. So, uh, I mean, I'm just... Melinda had really shitty parents and really needed some help. And I really... I mean, I feel like... I, I feel like her... The one person that she felt like she could turn to that had her back couldn't handle all the stuff going on in her life and left her for Shanda. That's not an excuse at all. I'm not excusing her behavior. I'm just saying I, I honestly believe girl needed, she needed help. The girl needed help and she did what she thought she had to do which was obviously not a good choice but we're also talking about kids whose brains are not completely formed and they don't have these this girl did not have parents to guide her yeah so Laurie was raised fundamentalist Pentecostal she was born October of 1974 her mom tried to strangle her once because she wore blue jeans. Yeah, she would go to school and change into jeans, and her um, her mom choked her. A social worker got involved, and the parents agreed that they would have unannounced visits. Um, she went to the mom went to Hope Rippy's house because she found out that Hope's dad had bought a Ouija board. And she demanded that the board be burnt and that the house be exercised. Fun fact, I have a Ouija board sitting in my kitchen. Um, 
You also have Ouija board stories on our YouTube channel. I do. I just uploaded a video of true Ouija board stories this week. And we have a um, paranormal craft time where we show you how to make Ouija boards. We need to do more uh, paranormal craft time videos. That was fun. So Laurie uh, began self-harming herself. And she pretended to be possessed by Deanna the Vampire. That's not a very vampire name. Um, and she became no, fascinated really. with the occult. Basically, she was Typical completely... Typical teenage girl stuff? Yeah. She was going through her goth phase and rebelling from the very strict religious upbringing that she was involved in. With proper parenting, she probably would not have killed anybody. Um, she was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder in 91, I think it was. Yeah. So, Hope is actually my age. And, um, really, no, there's nothing... Hope tra- is along for the ride. Yeah, mostly. there was nothing really traumatic that, you know, she was a self-harmer at 15, but, I mean, I hate to say this, but, like, I feel like so many girls go through the, that stage where, like, they've got a friend that does it, so they do it. And I don't know why. Like, I mean, I've heard, because Abby's had several friends who have been self-harmers, and they, those people, the, those girls have said that they hurt like they're just so hurt inside that that gives them an outlet to feel yeah I totally don't understand I don't either but you know I don't think a lot of people realize that those angsty teenage years for girls are are really awful like that is the time where they need their parents the most and it's also the time that they want their parents the least I mean it's a tough balance because I mean they don't want you in their business they don't want you around but that's absolutely absolutely when they need need you you. Um, and I, I mean I have been very blessed to have parented in a way that my kids have always been super open and honest to me about everything and sometimes they share uh, and I don't want to hear <laughs> but I listen because I need I need to hear I need to know what's going on and so they feel very comfortable with me telling me you know I mean I know who does drugs at their school I know who's having sex at their school I know I know who the I know who the self-harmers are you know, I know all of this stuff because they feel comfortable in telling me what's going on. And I always want that. Um, Tony Lawrence was born in February of 76. So she's also my age. Um, and she was, she was also raped. Actually, I think Hope was probably the only one of this whole group that did not have some kind of traumatic sexual experience. That we know of. That we know of. Right. She may have just not said in an interview or anything. But, so, uh, Tony was raped at 14. And, uh, so, really the only thing that happened in that case was the police told the boy to stay away from her. She did have, she did get counseling though. Well. She got counseling, but she didn't stick to counseling. Right. Counseling only works if you actually go to counseling and, you know, go to more than one or two sessions. Correct. You actually Um, have to go to She tried to kill herself in eighth grade and also began self-harming. That's a universal trend among the girls in this group. Right. Oh, so, um, 
I just want to say that Laurie said in an interview, it, it was a, actually it was a Dr. Phil interview, and I feel like I feel like this was a baited question. Most of Dr. Phil's questions are. Correct. Well, so Laurie said, she was asked, why do you think some people kill? And she said, well, I feel that some people kill for the fear that they see in the victim's eyes and for the sight of blood on their bodies. My opinion, they do it to feel superior or a high uh, from the victim's fear and the thirst for blood spill. And of course, I, I know I agree with that. Some do, right? And but Doctor Phil was talking to somebody else. I'm not sure who the other person was, but he said, "And do you think she was talking about herself?" Okay. Well, in interviews, Laurie has said about herself that it got it got out of control, and that she would have stopped it, and she absolutely regretted her actions. In that interview, she didn't seem like a person who was thirsting for blood and all of that. I think at the time, she got carried away with what was going on. I mean... Yeah, and I think that when Dr. Phil asked her that question, her mind went to the women that she is in prison with. Right, because you keep in mind, people, that these are babies. I mean, these are... Who were tried as adults. 15, 16, and 17 year old. I mean, yes, Laurie was 17, and technically that's almost an adult. But I don't let, I don't let my 14 year old stay home alone. I definitely wouldn't want her about to be locked up in prison with adults who have done awful, awful, awful things. Oh, God. Amy would probably end up being in prison ringleader within the week. Probably. I mean, Abby is... She's just got that personality about her, Holly. Abby's 18, and I, she still has to um, tell me every, everywhere she's going. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure that Laurie was not thinking, oh, well, this is why I killed her. I just think she got caught up in it. Like, at first, when they were talking about it, it, honestly, I think that I think I honestly think that Melinda got caught up in it too. Right. I mean, we hear about. I that think all yes, the time. she kept saying she was going to kill her. She was going to kill her. But I think that even for her, it escalated and got out of hand and snowballed. Right, and then at that point, you have to because you don't, you can't lose face. To these people who yes. look up to you. If you lose that, then you have nothing. And that's all she had. So, Melinda got um, I cannot remember what she got sentenced for. Is it 60 years? 60 years. I think. Well, anyway, she is going to be out definitely the earliest she can February be released is next year. Right. Yeah, so September of 2019 she year. could be. But they are projecting that she's going to get out in 2021. All of the other girls have already been released. Right. Laurie actually got released on the 26th anniversary of the day that Shanda was found. Um, Tony was released this year, earlier this year. Hope Ruby actually, she was released in 2013. She served the least amount of time. And I can kind of see that because she had the least amount of involvement in this. Right. Um, now, um, Melinda's attorney actually tried to get her out several years ago by saying that she was profoundly retarded by her childhood abuse. I can see that. I'm, I usually I do. don't, like, I usually do not excuse violent behavior because of childhood. But this poor girl was still a child. She was still living that nightmare. Oh, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Tony was released in um, 2000. Okay. And Hope was released in um, 2006. So, I mean, they've been out for some time. Yeah. Now, 
this is where I'm ugh about Jackie Shayer or whatever her last name is now. She okay, Melinda trains dogs in prison for the ICANN program and she's doing phenomenal. I mean, uh she she's really she's really gotten the help that she needed in prison. Um Actually, several prisons around the country have dog training programs, and it is wonderful, not only for the dogs, but for the inmates. So if you can, if you get a chance to adopt a dog from one of these programs, do it. Yeah, I, I was just so blown away by Melinda's progress. Uh, but I mean, she got what she finally needed. You know, she got, she got help. And she was given a purpose by training these dogs. So yes. when she gets out, she's actually going to be doing better than before she went in. And that's, ne that's hardly ever It's going case. to be a very big change for her, though. Oh, she yeah. Because, I mean, she when, was a baby she, still. I couldn't imagine. I mean, like, all of the things that I have done since I graduated high school... Um, all of the things that she's done cell uh, phones didn't exist when these girls went in to prison right we still have big hair I mean look at their look at their booking pictures hair bands were a thing I, you know what I still have not gotten used to the fact that hair bands died and grunge took over like I held a, such a grudge against Nirvana for years I mean, that's just a side note, we, but... And then we did a Kurt Cobain episode. We did a Kurt Cobain episode, yeah. Um, but Jackie gave Melinda a dog to train in Shanda's name, in her honor. And I thought, man, that's fantastic. Like, she is a much bigger person than me. Because I can tell you, yeah, these are kids. And yeah, they had traumatic experiences that I do believe led to their awful behavior if something was to happen to my child either of my children you do not want to be that person or like Emmy gets so mad at me because I tell her over and over if something happens to you in a school shooting my very very next move is to knock on their parents door they will never have they will those the parents of but, the victim will never be able to be that parent that everybody looks at in the store and you know shies away from because you know they raised that kid no if i can't harm the person that hurt my kid because let's say they shoot themselves too i will hunt their parents down because that's how i am so I, every time I see victims' parents who are, you know, a better person, like, um, like Jackie giving Melinda a dog to train, or, but I, don't I can't think, think right that now. Jackie but, is a, I don't think that Jackie is a better person though, because she has put so much of this blame on. Amanda. Right. And that's where I was getting with that. Is that I used to think that she was such a better person. And, and I look up to that. I'm like man. I want to be that better person. But I also know that you will probably have to chain me down. To keep me from retaliation. If something happens to my kid. That's just how I am. And I know that that's how I am. So you best just not touch my kids. Watching the video of Amanda. And listening to how Jackie reacted and how she kept calling her a molester. And, and watching how she's reacting. Her right, body language. And blaming her blaming her for the murder. Even though Amanda, even though Amanda is like, I gave all of these letters to the juvenile prosecutor. I told my dad. I told people what she was saying. It's not my fault that the adults didn't do anything. What else was I supposed to do? You know, I mean, I'm 15 you know, years old. That is exactly it. 
the adults in this situation dropped the ball. And, you know, Dr. Phil was like, oh, are there you blaming the mom? Well, at some point, parents need to take responsibility, too. And you cannot blame a 15-year-old who did everything that she thought she could do because, I don't know, she's 15 years old. When did we get into this point in our culture where we can't tell parents, hey, you really screwed up there? I don't know. But I, I actually, I think we did at the point where parents feel like they can't discipline their kids and I'm telling you nothing makes my blood boil and makes me want to shake people more than hearing that statement listen I have a degree in early childhood development I work with teachers every day that is my day job and when I hear People say, well, I can't do anything. They'll get taken away from me. I want to smack them. There is a difference between guiding your kids into making right decisions. There is a difference between teaching your kids how to properly behave. There is a difference between positive guidance and beating the shit out of your kid. And if you don't know that difference, please get parenting classes before you give birth. Please. You can find parenting classes available for free. And if you don't, and you are in Kentucky... Contact your local Department of Social Services. If you are in Kentucky, or Ohio, Indiana, West Virginia, or Southeast Virginia... Southeast... No. Southwest... Hold on. Whatever the wise Cumberland Gap area of Virginia is, if you were in that area and you can't find parenting classes, but you really feel after listening to this that you need them, drop me a line, honey. I will come and parent teach parent teach you. I will teach you how to po- <laughs> I will teach you how to positively discipline your child. I might not be able to talk while I'm doing it, but I can. I used, I mean, before my contract says I can't train, that's, I used to train too. I used to do classes um, for teachers on various topics. And one of my favorites to do is a positive guidance class. So I will happily teach you the ways and none of it will involve timeout, which people seem to think is the only thing that they're allowed to do which is my absolute least favorite thing to do and surprisingly holly was able to raise semi-normal and decent children without actually spanking them right they i mean they've never been to therapy um and they have never killed anybody so i mean i feel like i'm doing okay abby's number one punishment when she was little was actually having her call me and explain what she did yeah it would break her heart and she would cry all the time um emmy Sometimes was she'd even get to the point where she just sent herself to her room because she didn't want to have to call me and tell me that you know she was bad at one point we were watching um south park and she said i don't think that i should be watching this and she grounded herself from watching south park <laughs> But then she forgot that she had grounded herself from watching it. And like five years later, she was like, hey, you remember when y'all grounded me from watching South Park? Yeah. And we were like, no. Uh, But anyway, there are tons of different ways that do not involve beating your kids. And I'm not saying that if you spank your child, you're beating them. I'm saying there are lots of ways that do not involve beating your kids. I mean, people, you're allowed to discipline your kids. Okay? You are. Can we just get over this myth that you can't? Because you can. And when I see people say that they can't, it it makes me want to stroke out. And there's a good chance that your children probably need to be disciplined. Well, at least a little bit. Probably. Um, 
people used to laugh because if I saw small children misbehaving in Walmart or wherever, but almost always Walmart, I could just give them a look, you know, that look, and they would stop what they were doing and I mean I didn't even have to know the kid or anything and it's not even a mean look it's just like I'm watching you and they would stop and for years all of my friends would call me Mary Poppins because I, I was like the kid whisperer so I definitely chose the right profession for myself In both regards. In both regards, right? I mean, because my minor was criminology. So, um, I don't know what I ever thought I was going to do with the two combination, but I feel like my life is, uh, it fulfills both of those well. Yeah. But yeah, I don't normally... And when I was prepping for this episode, I knew that we was going to get into a parenting debate on this well, episode. I, I, you know, I can't help it. I, I can't help it because I feel awful that Shanda was murdered. I do. I, I mean, like, it ties my stomach in knots. And how the brutality of how she was killed, I cannot even imagine living through that as long as she did. And I can't imagine being her parents. I mean, her dad drank himself to death at 53 because he couldn't handle what happened. Yeah. I, mean, I couldn't time, imagine either. He let her go because he was the one, you know, he right. was there. I mean, I, I hurt so bad for her parents. And in a weird twist, because I have never had murderer sympathy before, I hurt for these girls because their parents let them down. The adults let them down. And for Jackie to victimize Amanda and say that she was just as guilty and deserved jail time too? No, she didn't, honey. She didn't. She tried to get help. You want to blame you want to blame people? Blame the other parents? Blame the adults who didn't have any kind of no, conversation with issues. you? Who didn't have any conversation with the killer's parents? Blame the adults all along the way who dropped the ball on this. And I I mean I feel like present day I feel like adults listen more and adults take it all more serious. I, f well, I, I think now we feel that I think parents now feel they have to because we've got teen suicides on the rise and we've got school shootings, school shootings. And although um, according to statistics, Schools are actually safer now than they were in the 90s. Oh, I know. I mean, when all of this was happening, it was right before the school shooting in Carter County. So, we but really... But do you remember how crazy your high school was with fights? Oh, listen, we had fights all the time. We were right beside a McDonald's and the only thing separating us was a gate that was never locked. We came and went as almost as we pleased. I mean, one time I skipped school and all I did was walk to the, uh, we had a, the, the, we had the school proper and then we had the pool house where the pool was, but there was some classrooms in there and it was right beside the football field. Well, you could sneak right to the football field, which was always open and then shoot across and then cut down the gate. Like, we could get in and out of that campus super easy. And nobody really stopped us. Anybody could have got on campus. We got off campus. The doors were never locked. We, I mean, we were just, we were allowed outside roaming around all the time. I mean, seriously, it's a, 
it's a wonder that something didn't happen. I remember one time there was a fight in the downstairs that there was blood all over the place because somebody like slammed somebody else's head into the pop machine. It was crazy. I remember the very first time I went uh, um, when I, our middle school and our high school are side by side. There's just a small parking lot in between. And the middle school did not have a band room. Actually, it technically did. But the teachers decided they needed that for a team building room. So, band students had to walk over to the high school for band class. My very first day walking yeah. over to the um, high school for band class, we walk in the side door, and there is this huge, like, 20-person brawl going on in the hallway. Crazy. Well... I mean, why I am not a high school English teacher, one, I apparently can't talk, um, and two, my very first day of observing at the high school that my children have gone to, I walk in the front door, and there's a fight before I even get to the principal's office, which is just a few feet away. Yeah. So I was like, uh, no, this is not for me. And that was in, what, 95, 96, something like that. So schools have come a long way. I, I really do feel safe sending my kids to school. Yeah. Surprisingly, because there's school shootings all over the place. But if the, every time that we have had any kind of lockdown, my kids have texted me immediately and told me, Except for that one time that Emmy's phone was not with her. I know. But Abby was, and they locked down the, both of the schools. But it was actually at Abby's, not Emmy's. So, uh, because one was in high school, one was in middle school. So, Abby told me what was going on. And then I had to send the message to Emmy because she was freaking out. Because she didn't really know what was going on. But, yeah. I mean, I think, I think the parents have came a long way as far as listening to their children and taking things seriously um but i mean there's always room for improvement right i mean i by no means um think so that I, I am I, the perfect parent i don't a friend of mine who is a um he was a cop and after the most recent um school shooting in florida he now during the day is assigned at one of the local schools as a resource officer, um, he messaged me last night to say, you know, that one of his students, one of his kids, committed suicide. God, I hate that. Yeah, I mean, and of course, kids' privacy wouldn't tell me even the name. He don't tell me the name or anything. But I mean, he was really broken up about this because this is a kid that he talked to every that he knew this kid was having issues, and he would talk to this kid every single day. Right, and I feel like. I mean, I can't speak for the high school that we went to now. Um, I know that their principal is wonderful. But I will say I, that the high school that my girls go to, I really feel like their teachers care about them. Um, especially the arts programs, because my kids are artsy kids. And those teachers really love and care about their kids. I mean, they... They do. The, the band, choir, and drama. I mean, kudos to you guys. And you get the least recognition of any other teachers. But you know, because when you're we, not a real class. When we were in school, the band teachers were always... And maybe it's because band students spend so much more time with their band teacher. Yeah. That you, you form a closer bond. You know, when every weekend you're spending, you know, 12 all hours. All day together. Yeah. Every day you've got class and you've got practice after. You've got ball games. For yeah. several weeks during the summer you're spending all day together for like three weeks at a time. That's yeah. true. And then the same with, you know, drama when they're putting on their plays and their musicals. I mean, I don't see my kids during during the spring musical time. 
yeah i'm just like i have kids like i haven't seen them yeah <laughs> they come home shower and go to bed um choir's not so busy but and i kind of but they always do the extra i mean my kids have always done the extra with all of that so they do all district um emmy's done all state you know they just uh any kind of choral festival that they can go to i just think that we really have good teachers here who really care about our kids and i kind of wonder how this would have been how this case would have been different if melinda and tony and laurie had been involved in one of the in some of these intense extracurricular activities right amanda was amanda was a basketball player Right, but she got kicked off the team because of this, and I don't understand why. Why she was punished for something that she actually tried to stop? Yeah. Right. Uh, I I feel sorry for every girl involved in this case, even though they're they're murderers. Right, and it's so weird because I'm usually just like, "Eh, let them fry. But, I mean, in this case, and maybe it's because they're so young, and I know that they never had, they never had a chance with their upbringing. I mean, r- rape is awful, but I can't imagine it so young, repeatedly, at the hands of a parent, and not having anybody to talk to or to help you. I just can't. My my heart absolutely breaks for Melinda. Yeah. And I hope. I mean I hope when she gets out. That she continues with dogs. I If she does. Because she has groomed dogs too. I, I take her my dogs. And let her groom them. Oh, they probably bite her. Because Max is. Uh, Max came from a hoarder house. And so he's very traumatized. About like being brushed. Or anything like that. So. You uh, need to call your vet about getting your dog's drugs to knock them out for grooming. I um, I basically have to catch him when he's in a good mood, and then uh, he lets me, he lets me snip on him <laughs> a little bit. But he's yeah, a mess. I, mean, <laughs> I hope that when Melinda gets out, I mean, I, hopefully she goes to a halfway house or something. To lessen the shock of this. But I mean, who does she have to come out to? Yeah, I have no idea. Her family is... Her family is part of the reason why she's in prison. Yeah, I hope I hope she doesn't turn to them. I mean, if her mom has gotten help, because her mom needed help. Yeah. If her mom got help, she might be a good person to turn to. Uh, and I mean, see, and that's why I hate to say that, you know, Melinda's mom n- needed help and didn't get it either. And you can't help your kids if you yourself need help. True. Right. The dad was just a piece of shit. That was heavy. We have something fun for a stupid criminal. So, Heather's uh, boyfriend, Anthony, sent sent us. We have a group chat. And he uh, sent a video of a Canadian convenience store arrest. That is hysterical. The um, At first, all you see is this woman running in the back. And then falling then crawling up trying to climb up ceiling and then like a couple seconds later you see her fall through the ceiling in a different part of the store and bounces off a shelf full of groceries and then she jumps up and then she turns herself in um and so he sent that little clip of the video, which is hysterical. And I don't know if we can... Uh, we'll upload that to our Facebook page. And then uh, he sent... He said, but wait, there's more. And then you see cameras at a different angle. 
and it is I guess the guy that she's with and they're running all over the store uh, trying to evade the police then you see her escape while they're trying to arrest him. And then she falls through. So then they go to her. And they get almost out the door. And they try to break and run for it. And they end up tackling the cop. So I don't know what they were trying to steal. But it wasn't worth that. Yeah, they were using stolen credit cards. Still. People. But I'm assuming the fact that they were... They went through all of that. That in addition to using stolen credit cards, they probably also had warrants out for them. Probably. But it was just crazy. And it happened in Canada. And I thought you guys were like nice and didn't do crap like that up there. Well, I mean, apparently they have stupid criminals also. The man was charged with um, using a stolen credit card, resisting arrest, attempting to disarm a police officer, possession of a stolen of stolen property, and breaching probation. So I guess that's why they were trying to run. Yeah. That he was on probation, and she was charged with obstructing an officer, failure to comply, and mischief. I'm guessing the mischief was for falling through the ceiling and wrecking that store. Yeah, I guess. Um, Crazy. If, but we'll we'll try to upload the video on Facebook and possibly Instagram. I don't hold your breath on that one though. Yeah. Well, that's all I've got. Um, as usual, Honda family. PB, if you would like to use our affiliate code to start your own podcast, and we are on Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, Facebook, all of those. We are Honda Family Podcast. And if you want to visit my Etsy shop and get true crime merchandise, it is cat hair and glitter. Not and it's just cat hair glitter. Um, don't forget to check out our YouTube channel because we've got interesting and exciting stuff coming in. Up in the next few weeks. Yep. So, anyway, thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. If you liked this episode, please take a moment to rate and review us on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast fix. You can also show your love by giving us a shout out on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. We are Haunted Family Podcasts everywhere. You can also tweet us by going to hauntedfamilypodcast.com slash tweet. For merchandise, please go to Holly's Etsy shop, etsy.com slash cat hair glitter. If you have a stupid criminal, paranormal story, or true crime suggestion, email us at hauntedfamilypodcast at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. <laughs>